used to say something that I still talk about a lot, which was, you know, we're going to throw a lot of watermelons on the cart and some of the watermelons are going to fall off and that's okay. And I think like, that's like, when you think about that, like that is really, that's success, right? You don't like sit there and only say, okay, I've got one thing and it's going to sit there because then that's risky. Right. Instead, you throw a lot on and you try and do the best you can with as many as you can. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You'll have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and welcome to Now to Next. When I recorded this podcast with Kara Golden, I had just gotten back from a trip on the road, and everything wasn't quite right in my setup, so there's a little bit of echo on her mic. So where I introduced her, and I, let me bring you up to speed where we're going to start, So because I was able to fix the audio on the fly. Um, Kara is the youngest of five kids. Um, she was living in Arizona in the Camelback area attending Arizona State University for journalism, and she was unsure, like many of us, what to pursue after college. And so she was working at as a waitress at a Mexican restaurant that still uh, exists in uh, the Scottsdale area today. And one day an older gentleman was sitting down at one of her tables, and they started talking about her studies and his profession. And he mentioned that he worked in product placement for Anheuser-Busch, the beer company. And she jokingly said, hey, uh, could you think you can get me a job? And he said, I could possibly get you an interview in L.A. if you're willing to start from the bottom and, and work your way up. Once you know that, you'll be able to follow along from here. Sorry for the glitch, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the interview. Thanks. Take care. Anyway, when I was, you know, planning on going out to L.A. for this job interview, which he uh, definitely showed up to to be able to get me in with the HR department at Anheuser Busch, I thought, you know, just to make it worth my while, do you know any other people who are in L.A. who are looking for entry level people? And what I figured out is, like, people actually do want to help. And especially, you know, when you're like a little bit established, you see this like young college kid, right? That you're just like, hey, can I guide you in some way? Can I be helpful? It's not really going to take him a lot of time. So he inter he introduced me to a few people. And as I was like telling the story along the way, I was in L.A. And then the guy, one of the guys that I was interviewing with in L.A. said, you're going to need to go up to San Francisco. So this ended up to be this like journey where it was like LA, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, New York over the next 30 days. And, you know, I reached out to friends. I knew friends in all these cities or didn't really know their parents. But I said, do you think, you know, it was kind of awkward, but I said, do you think your parents might let me like stay with them for a couple nights while I'm interviewing for a job? And, and, you know, I'd always have a, a little bit of money set aside that I'd buy a plant or a bottle of wine or something like I was polite about it. I was very conscious about, you know, being a good guest, making my bed, you know, after each one and thanking them and all this stuff. But yeah, I mean, I, I had over 90 interviews over the next 30 days just by telling people like what I wanted. Right. And what I was looking for and that I was willing to start at the bottom. But I had no idea what I was going to learn in that journey. Like, I didn't know what a consultant was. I'm interviewing at Bain and all these, like, different jobs, like, right out of college. And I think people were just really intrigued. And also, I found that actually going in through an executive, like, is a very different course than actually applying for a job that you see posted. Like, somebody, you know sees that or Nick calls up his friend in Chicago and says, hey, listen, I don't really know this woman, Kara, but she's a new grad. She's really nice. She's willing to like work hard. And, you know, would you mind seeing her? And you're actually solving a problem for them, right? They're looking for somebody that some kind of has a connection, but is also willing to, you know, pay for her way out there, um, you know, and and so that that's what I did. And and ultimately landed in New York um, where you know, was really my dream job. And it was it was definitely shooting high. But my dream job was to work at Fortune magazine. And I mean, that's another story I cover in my book that, you know, 
I, I just, I, I had no idea whether or not it was going to work out, but I thought if nothing else, it'd be kind of fun just to go to New York, right? That's as far as I had gotten. And, yeah. you know, I'm like a college student and I've got a free place to stay and, you know, and why not? And um, I mean, those 30 days talk about impact and like those 30 days, I think back on it a lot. And, you know, these poor, like entry level people who have come to work at Hint or AOL with me over the years, like I've told that story that, you know, if you really want something and you really want to go and like work somewhere and you're really curious about someplace or, you know, or you just like, why not go and just reach out to them? And I think today it's even easier to reach out to people and say, like, I really admire you. I was, I've been reading about you. I, I, you know, love either what you do or your company does. And, you know, what do you have to lose? Like, there's, you got like a 50% shot that they're going to actually write back or they're going to just blow it off. Right. Or maybe they say, sure, come on in. Yeah. I found so man, there's, there's so much in there. First of all, you invested in yourself. And so as a, I, I've owned my own business for a long time, clearly you have now too. And, and you've been, a, you were an executive a long time before that. When you see someone who exhibits, uh, self-awareness, um, self-improvement, like you're like, this is like two out of three, like, uh, like you're about to find a unicorn, right? So by the fact of the matter that you, um, with your, your job with reaching out to the, the publisher of fortune, like a well-written now email back in the day, probably a fax, but even a letter to someone who is of importance, you, we do find the higher someone climbs up the ladder. I think the more they live by sort of the Warren Buffett rules, uh, where they read a lot, they sort of think a lot. You actually, the, most of the people working at the highest, highest levels are not uh, nine to nine busy bees every day. They're like looking no. for strategy and ways to improve. And so you can actually get their attention by writing them a well articulated message that actually provides them some value. Also, um, I've done a thing quite a few times trying to get someone's attention has worked. Uh, my secret is I, I'll sometimes film a video and put it on an iPad and I'll FedEx the iPad. Now, it does a couple mm. different things, but at the very least, the person who gets it goes this nick spent 500 bucks to get my attention like he invested in himself the least i could probably do is give a response and i've gotten i've never not gotten a response from that strategy um maybe everyone will start using it and that's okay but i think the fact of the matter that you went on a multi-city tour and you went and you showed up at the ma at fortune magazine's office saying hey you know the the publisher editor said that if i was ever in new york you know i should I should come stop by. And they're like, well, we meant book an appointment. But you're like, well, I'm here. I mean, that to me shows I would have done the same thing because it showed you invested in yourself. And it is very hard if you are polite. I've run across, I'm sure you have too, many an email, a message, someone who comes to your office who feels like you owe them something that never gets them anywhere. But that nice, polite, hey, that sort of... um country bumpkin ish what do you mean <laughs> you know like oh they said to stop yeah. by are they not here today uh i've been in the music business for years and people would i'd be on panels at, at music conferences like there's this one you know that if i could just meet the president of this record label i could i'd just stop them right there so you can they're like what do you mean i said that person goes to the same office every day 90 percent of the time like if you really want it like go find a friend to stay with in new york city before the pandemic and wait outside their office every day from 7 a.m. till 10 a.m. and you are likely to bump into them. Now, don't be creepy. Don't you know? But like, there, there are so many ways that if you just take a little initiative, that you can find. Totally. Ways. And your story is that over and over and over. Your very, 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 very first job of was in a toy store, and you you took initiative to to go and ask, hey, can I have that job? Similar things have happened for me. And one of the things that I think I would love to figure out how to articulate for people out of this interview because it, it's a lot in your book. By the way, everyone go buy a copy. 10 copies everyone for christmas undaunted great book uh thank you it, no problem it is uh it's the fact that if you will just take some initiative and step out and be willing to serve i was gonna get to this later but when you got to um you move to sam you you work at first of all you work uh at 
uh, Time Warner, you move over to CNN, sort of emerging news market. You then move to San Francisco with your now husband, and you open up the Wall Street Journal. You find this business called Two Market. Uh, started by a spinoff from Steve Jobs, and you cold call him and go have lunch with him and learn about this new business, which is essentially the burgeoning beginning of e-commerce on CD-ROMs. One of, the, one of my favorite things that you said is you went now to try to sell this to people who really – who are at the top of their games, you know, heads of J. Crew and other big catalog marketers and others, but they hadn't – they didn't know much about e-commerce. And so you had to step into a role that actually you had been probably playing your whole life and not realized, even as a waitress, of consultative selling. Like people want to know, like, hey, mm -hmm. I don't know what you know. Help me. And when you don't – there's another quote from the book. Don't make the decision maker feel stupid. When you're willing to do that, you're really stepping into a place of service. And it's amazing the doors that open. So that was a long ramp, but I'd love your feedback on, on that. Yeah, no, I mean, it was it was crazy. And I think like that's another story where when I moved to San Francisco, I had never spent any time. And, you know, I, I pretty much my husband was from New York and, you know, he didn't he was taking a job at a law firm. And I was I was really not even looking for a job because I was getting married in six months. But I had been following this guy, Steve Jobs, for years. And people were like, you know, I'd read about it. I mean, I'm just like, he's just so cool. It's just ridiculous. Like I had been when I was in college, like I had, you know, an iMac and, you know, I was just like, it's so beautiful. It has a pretty apple on it. It's like, you know, there's just like, I just really followed just how, you know, he made products like beautiful and easier. Right. And that's as far as I had gotten. So when I moved to Silicon Valley or San Francisco, really, at, at the time, I had, you know, read in the newspaper about this project, and it wasn't meeting with Steve Jobs. It was meeting, you know, with these guys who had worked for Steve Jobs. But I just thought it was, I was just intrigued. And again, I wasn't really looking for a job, but I, I saw it was in San Mateo. And I'd kind of seen, like, the signs for San Mateo just outside of SFO. And I thought, gosh, like that's not too far from San Francisco. I can get in my car and drive down there if he agrees. And I reach out to this guy and I just, who was the guy quoted in the article. And I said, Hey, I'm not looking for a job, but I'm just really intrigued by what you guys are doing. And I, uh, you know, totally get it that the, um, you know, the internet is too slow. And so the graphics are, you know, you put them on a disc like it's kind of brilliant and he's like and he's like yeah well what what do you do are you like in the technology and i said no 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 no. i just moved here from san francisco and um you know can i take you to coffee and uh and he said well we you know we can definitely have lunch i'd love to hear about your experience and so as i'm hearing more about this company uh, he says to me, uh, he, he was like, so what did you do in New York? And I told him about working at CNN and he was just intrigued because this, this is the early days of CNN. And he's like, what's Ted Turner like? Like it was just, right. you know, it was just, he was just intrigued by it. And it was a whole different world. And, and, uh, I said, so I have one question, like, how do you guys make money? And he was like, well, we haven't really figured that out yet. And I was like, wait, like, I've been so used to like listening to CNN talk about money. You guys don't like really care about making money. I was like, no, no, we care about making money. We just haven't figured it out yet. And they're product guys. Right. And, and so I was just kind of laughing and he said, do you want to help us make money? And I'm like, what do you mean? Like help you make money. And he was like, we'll hire you and your job will be get to go out to like all these catalogers. So I was like, I know nothing about catalogs and retailers other than the fact that I like shop from them. And he was like, that's fine. He was like, you'll get it. You know how to do this stuff. You're like selling, you know, you're doing the airport channel for CNN. You didn't have monitors in airports before you got there. You'll figure this stuff out. And I'm like, oh, okay, maybe. So I get this offer letter from him and I'll, I'll never forget. I'm like making a little bit more money than I was making in New York. And, uh, my husband, you know, is a new attorney and he's reading through their, the employment agreement. And he's like, they're giving you equity in the company. And I was like, and I was like, what, what do you mean? And he was like, they're giving you equity. It's like, I mean, it's like two cents and stuff, but they're giving you like shares of this company. And, uh, and I said, uh, I said, wow, like, wow. And he was like, you know, it's pretty cool. I mean, you, 
Sorry, my dog. Someone's at the front door, but it's fine. That's okay. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. It'll, um, so he said, uh, you know, you can always like quit if, if it doesn't work out, but he said, I've never seen anything like this. Like they're giving you like equity. And so that was my first like taste and, and of it. And I just thought, you know, what, what do I have to lose if I take this job? So, you know, going into the educational side of it, I mean, I truly didn't know what I was doing. I was just like calling people and I, there was no like, in char- like person in charge of like the internet. And so I, I just thought like, you know, I don't know, I'll just like figure out who the CEO is and I'll just call them. And like, and there were a lot of people who were like, no, thank you. But there was, you know, Mickey Drexler was at the gap at the time. And, and, uh, his assistant was like, yeah, he, he wants to talk to you. Cause I said, I want to bring the gap onto the internet. And he, they, and he was like, uh, he was like, so tell me how you're going to do that. And I said, well, I should really show you. And he said, okay, fine. Nine 30 and Tuesday or whatever. And when I got in there, I mean, the, the, you know, that's when I, I was showing him the computer and I was, and he said, wait a minute. So this is a, like, is this a TV or is this like a computer? And I thought, you know, right at that moment, like no one can prepare you for those. And he's brilliant, right? He's like completely brilliant. And so I just thought, no, you know what? I thought that as well when I first saw this, like, it's amazing um, but you know, this is kind of, this is what we're thinking about. If we put the graphics onto the CD and he was like, God, this is really interesting. Do you mind if I bring some more people into this? And so all of a sudden I have like, you know, six meetings with Mickey Drexler over the next few weeks. I have friends that are, that I new friends that are like working at the gap. They're like, you're meeting with like the executive team at the gap. Like, this is crazy. And I was like, yeah, I get, I mean, I'm teaching them about like these different services and, and it's free. Like, why wouldn't they meet with me? And so, you know, it was, it was a story of, as I put in the book, like, you know, sometimes you get these opportunities where, you know, you just kind of show up, you don't, you, you know, show up to sort of ultimately get the sale, but they're just, you know, I learned as much from that about strategy and, and about, you know, again, like I'm in front of like these decision makers, but I'm also just like, so like blown away by the fact that I'm sitting there actually talking to them about the internet. And it took us a while, but ultimately we did end up getting the gap and, and many other retailers. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that a lot of people say like, were you scared to like meet with them? And I'm like, uh, maybe a little bit like I was I didn't know what he'd be like initially. And then I got in there and I think it's the same thing that I always, you know, tell people when they're meeting with the CEOs, like the more that we're all the same people. Right. Like it's just it, it's like some of us, you know, want to engage more than others. Right. And some of us I think that all of us want to learn. Right. And we're lifelong learners. We may not know that about ourselves, but I think like the most bored people today who are CEOs or who are accomplished, successful people, if they aren't learning, they're depressed. Right. And they're and they're not very happy people. And I think that the minute that they start learning and jumping into things that kind of challenge them, they just become, you know, better people. And that's why I think you know, that's a story that I really wanted to share with people because I think it's an important one. I love it. And uh, uh, one of my coaches, Dan Sullivan, a strategic coach, Dan says, yeah, "Yeah, there's people who seek status and people who seek growth. You only ever really want to be working with people who seek growth. And that's, you know, another one of your your, uh, statements in the book, always be learning. And I think, you know, our there are people in the world who are jerks. Like, let's just get that on the table. But I think one Mm -hmm. of the things that took me forever to realize is that, oh, wait, that's not on me. That's on them. But when you're young and you're coming up and you're trying to get someone's attention, you're, you're trying to be useful and helpful. Uh, like you were in that situation, you get nervous. Like the first time I interviewed Tony Robbins, I was nervous as all get out. When I walked into Virgin Galactic and Richard Branson's across me, I'm like, you know, it's like, it's an adrenaline. scary. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. You've seen these people and held them up on a, you know, with Tony Robbins, I'd heard thousands of hours of his voice in my car speakers as a teenage tennis player. And, you know, you're like, you, you build these people up to be, I mean, gods in a way, right? They clearly are not, they're human beings, but your, your brain has done this to you. And so it's, it's totally normal to feel like a little bit nervous. Um, but the best part of it and what they if they're good people, what they really desire is to engage with someone who's 
interested in them and what they're doing and interesting. I have never found anyone who's a good human being that I can't have a great connective conversation with that can lead to more, can lead to opportunity if I'm just interested in what they're doing and what I'm doing is interesting to them. And so I, I would encourage anybody who is really worried about that cold call thing. There's ways to do it. There's there's polite ways to do it. There's pushy ways to do it. But man, you have nothing to lose ever by sending totally. a quick email, especially if it's respectful and polite. That's how I met Mark Cuban. I cold called Mark Cuban. I said, hey, Mark, I'm thinking blah, blah, Mark and I have never done any business together, but I've interviewed him once. And I connected him and Dick Vitale, the famous basketball announcer. And in one email, Mark Cuban donated $500,000 to the V Foundation to stop children's cancer. But like it was just connecting dots with reasonable people. So I guess what I'd really encourage everyone here to do is if there's someone who you think you can provide value in their life, they might be a jerk and you don't know it. And if they are better for you, they're not in your life, but make the shot, like take the shot. What, what What's the worst that's going to happen? I've rarely have ever been completely berated by somebody. And if I have been, it's really, they're having a bad day. And again, you got to remember not to take a lot of this stuff personally, especially if you don't have a relationship. These people are just human beings and people do have bad days sometimes, but yeah, I've found more often than not people are, especially at the highest levels, people are really totally. willing to help and serve those who are, uh, uh, who are coming up and trying to to provide value. I mean, you get to a certain point in your career where you realize that I, there's no way I got here on my own. Like self-made is the worst term on earth. Like we're all community made, right? And so I realized how lucky I was to have not only supportive parents, like that's, that in first, not only, I wasn't born in America, but came to America when I was one, like super lucky and fortunate to be in a place that encourages growth and, and you know, and personal development. And, and so like, all, a lot of this stuff is luck. And so I was I was lucky to meet some people on the way who are like, you know what? Or, you know, sometimes you sit on an airplane next to somebody and it changes everything. Totally. Right? And so take those shots. All right. So you you have a storied career now looking back to me. You worked for Time Warner. You worked for CNN like in like the super crazy Wild West days, which, which I know had some ups and downs. You then go to uh, Two Market, which gets bought by AOL. Subsequently actually ends up back with Time Warner. But you... You realize that eh, you want to do something a little bit different. You have three kids by now, and you're sort of taking a break from figuring out what you want to do. Your husband is working uh, in, in the tech sector as well, brilliant guy. And so, you, but your health isn't great. You, you had three kids in a very short period of time. You're finding yourself having just all the effects of what I would say, like overwork, overstress. You said you had acne breakouts, you're overweight. Um, Tell us about that period of your time uh, of time in your life and, and what your what your brain was going through to try to solve that. Yeah, so I had taken a few years off. I, AOL uh, was acquired by Time Warner and my all my former companies, CNN, all came into one. I stayed on for uh, to to sort of be a part of the transition team. My husband actually was at Netscape and he was also an acquisition. And so, I mean, it was pretty crazy that all my former companies and, and the company that my husband was working for were all coming into one. And so we both like felt like, okay, let's just take a break. Um, we were redoing a house in San Francisco. We had these three kids. I remember people saying to me, like, don't take too much time off. And I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, because you won't be marketable. And I was like, how long? Like, what is it? And they're like, I don't know. Like, and nobody could give me like an answer. I mean, how many times have people like said that to you? And, and uh, like, if you've ever taken a break, I'm like, okay, is it six months? Yeah. Well, no, th you know, to some people that's too long. Other people are, it's like, yeah, that's, that's like good, but don't do anything longer than that. So I was always like, like thinking about like, what people said in PS, like my opinion on this is like, you got to chart your own course. And, you know, you can always like, you're, it, it doesn't matter. I know people who have like taken 10 years off. They were saying right? don't become irrelevant is what they really were saying. Some, some people yeah. take time off and just forget about the rest of the world, which is fine. But like, if you're not always learning, you will become irrelevant. And that's, I think that's what they're yeah. working against, but they're saying it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, totally. But anyway, so so this was, you know, I was trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to do. I was I was continuing to interview with tech companies because I had come from tech. The thing that was like probably the showstopper for me in so many cases was everybody wanted me to go and build what I had built at AOL and like crush AOL. And I thought, 
wow, why would I want to do that? Like I worked my tail off to like build this incredible thing. Why would I want to like go and crush it? And so I, I wanted to do something different. Um, but everybody said, yeah, I'm sure you could do that, but we really need this. And, and in e-commerce and I thought I've already done that. Like, am I going to go do that again? Maybe for me again, I think it was, it was this concept of learning. And, and that's when I, you know, had gained a bunch of weight over the course of a few years. And, and my, um, I didn't even call it a health issue at the time so much. I, I really was looking at it kind of individually. Like I had acne, I had low energy and I was fat. Like, and, and that's like, as far as I had gotten. And I was like, and again, I like, you know, my husband said, you look great. Don't worry about it. Like, you know, like everybody was nice to me about it, but I, I knew that I just didn't feel the same and it wasn't like I wanted to like fix it. So I, I wasn't working. So I had plenty of time. I, you know, was being a mom to these young kids, but I thought I'm going to start working out. I know how to do that. I, you know, I'm going to watch what I'm eating. I'm going to look at some different diet programs and then suddenly, like I had gotten into this habit of reading labels in the food, but the drinks that I was drinking, like uh, one day this diet soda, this diet Coke in particular was facing me. And I was like, God, there's like 30 ingredients in this diet Coke. Like, I don't even, I mean, I've put all these like rules on my food, but here I am like sitting here drinking this every single day. And I remember like telling my husband when he was changing the oil in my car, I was like, only use the certain type of oil because it's like, it makes my car go better. And I was thinking, it's sort of ironic. Like I'm like, I know I care more about what I'm putting into my car than I do my own body. And I, and I had this like aha moment. And then I'm like, it's, there's probably nothing that bad in here. Cause it's diet. And I thought, well, why like, how do they define diet? Again, I wasn't working, so I had plenty of time to like think about the stuff that I had been kind of like fooled by these healthy perception products for this healthy reality, but I still wasn't sure. So that's when I put it to the side as a test. I said, I'm going I'm to test this for two weeks and see what happens. And my husband's like, you've been drinking Diet Coke for a long time like that. Uh, you're just going to put it to the side. And I said, yeah, I can't drink like one. I need to just be like goodbye and not. So if you see me like buying it, like hide it from me. I don't want it. So and I start to like 10 a day, right? Like 10, 12, like not just like one. Yeah. Or two. yeah. Like eight to 12. Like sometimes it wasn't cans. Sometimes it was like, you know, when I lived in Arizona, I was going to circle K and, you know, filling up my, my super big gulp from seven 11, whatever. So I was, um, yeah. So, so I put it to the side and about two weeks later, no more acne on my face uh, my energy levels were totally different and my clothes were fitting differently. And I got on the scale and I had lost 24 pounds in two and a half weeks. So I was like, whoa, like what just happened? I actually thought I was sick. And I thought like, there's something wrong with me. Like I've, to gain, I've lost, like, I mean, this kind of like happened overnight and made no other change other than that. And then I just was like shocked by it. And I, and people, when you lose that much weight that quickly, people notice and they're like, are you okay? Is everything like what happened? And I tell people the story and they're like, come on, like you're drinking diet soda. You stopped drinking diet soda, like diet soda is healthy. And I said, is it like, I mean, I, I, like, I just didn't know I wasn't a nutritionist, but I was like, why do you think it's healthy? And they're like, because like, you know, celebrities drink it and they're all, you know, really healthy. And I was like, really? I mean, again, this was 16 years ago. I, I wasn't, you know, disagreeing with them. I was just saying, why do you think that? And then a friend was sharing with me that she had figured out that vitamin water at the time, there wasn't even a diet version, had 300 calories in it. And initially she, and lots of sugar, more sugar than a can of Coke. And I was like, wow, like that's so crazy because people think vitamin and water right. and that's better for you. And it's like, and she was like, yeah, no, it, it's like crazy that. And I said, yeah, there's all these healthy perception things that are out there that really aren't. And then I started thinking about it even, you know, bigger, like, wow, there's like people who are willing to spend money on diet plans or in, you know, fancy grocery stores. And all they're trying to do is get healthy. And that's just like really sad, you know, and it, it, that we're actually like as a society fooling these people. And 
again, like I was just making sort of a bat, like, like a broad statement on this. And that's when, um, I thought, okay, well maybe I should just go, I've been slicing up fruit and throwing it in the water, um, just to get myself to drink the water. Cause I hated water. And I, I thought maybe I should just like, it'd be so great if there was a bottle that just had fruit in it. And I had no idea what I was talking about, but I went to my local Whole Foods because I thought if any place would have it, it would be that. And I show up there and asking the guy who's stocking the shelves, he's like, well, there's a carbonated version. I'm like, no, I don't have anything against carbonation, but uh, but you can't drink eight glasses of water a day if it's carbonated. And he was like, that's true. I mean, maybe you can, but it, it's just it's just a lot. You'll feel like you're going to blow up. And he's like, yeah, and it has a lot of sodium in it, too. So if you're really like trying to drink water, it's probably, you know, not the best bet. And I said, yeah, I want still with fruit. And there, and he was like, we don't have anything like that. I'm like, come on. So I go to Safeway. I end up traveling to New York that next week. I look in New York nothing's there. And so I was like, God, this is so fascinating. Maybe I should just like, you know, launch it, see what happens. And, um, and so I went back to Whole Foods and I said to the guy stocking the shelves, I didn't even know there was like a national buying office for Whole Foods. I said, so what's it going to take like to just get a product on the shelf? And he said, well, you have to have a label you have to like put it all together. And I'm like, okay, assuming I get all that done, like, what do I do? Just bring it into you? And he said, yeah, you know, we have a local program at Whole Foods where, you know, if it's locally produced, then, you know, we'll, we try and like get a little bit of product on the shelf and see how it works. And, and I said, okay. So I went back to my husband and I said, um, so, okay, I got this idea. I'm going to launch this product. This is a couple of weeks later and I'm going to write a business plan and, uh, or I've written part of a business plan and I'm going to get it, uh, I, I'm going to get it on the shelf at Whole Foods and it's called Wawa and it's uh, and he's just listening to this whole thing. I've got three kids under the age of four. He knows that I'm like interviewing with all these tech companies and he's like, you know, really? Like, so you're going to launch a beverage company. What do you know about beverages? And I was like, well, I wake up every day and I just think like if if more people would drink water, we wouldn't have like we wouldn't have issues with, you know, weight, we wouldn't be talking about this new thing called type two diabetes. Like I was like connecting all of these dots and he, and he's like, I think that the thing that I really like is that you're really excited about it. Cause you're interviewing with all these tech companies and you just don't seem that psyched about it. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. I, I and he's like, what's the name? And I said, it's called Wawa. And he was like, okay, you know, the lawyer in him was like, there's this huge chain on the East Coast called Wawa. Don't call it Wawa. And plus, it's like, I know you call like the kids drinks, you know, drink your Wawa in, in their sippy cups. And he was like, people don't really do that. Like, that's not a good name. And and so I was I was not very happy with him at this moment because I said, you know, I, I like I've been thinking a lot about this and it's a great whatever. And he said, just keep talking to me for a little while about the product. And I said, OK, we're, you know, it, it's we're giving people hints. It's like got a little bit of hint, like a hint of flavor in it. And and I didn't even know what I was saying. And then all of a sudden I was like, hint, he was like four letter word. You'll never get the trademarks on it. And I wasn't very happy with him at this moment because I just thought like, you know, he's not liking anything that I'm talking to him about. So I decided there was no better time than to share with him that I was pregnant with our fourth child. And so he was like standing in the living room going, wait, seriously, like you're pregnant with your fourth child and you're launching a beverage company. And so and you have no idea what you're doing. And I said, yep. And I, I just took $50,000 out of her bank account. And I just didn't want you to think I was going on some boondoggle with my girlfriends to the Bahamas or something. Like, I've got to buy caps and bottles. And I've got this factory in Chicago. And he's like, whoa, like, wait, wait, what? And I said, yeah. And he's like, wait, you're pregnant? And I mean, it was like the whole thing. And he walked out of the room. I didn't know if he was coming back. Like, I was just like, wait, where'd he go? And then he came back and he said, you know, I'm not very happy about this, but let me come with you because maybe 
I think he thought he could talk some sense into me, like on the plane ride to Chicago, uh, as well as like, while well, we saw the bottles rolling off. And instead, what he saw was he was like, this is so interesting. He's the son of a doctor. And he had always heard how frustrated his dad was by, you know, trying to give people suggestions on how to get healthier as a he's a gastroenterologist. And he said, you know, you're actually telling people just go drink this and it tastes really good and it has fruit in it and it'll help you drink water. And he said, you're you're actually telling people to just go do this for two bucks or less a bottle. You're not telling them to go get a prescription or go on some diet plan. You're just saying, just go drink this. And they do. And then all of a sudden, like you, changes happen. And he was like, that that's wild. He was like, that is so genius on like a lot of levels. And I was like, so you think that's a good idea now? And he was like, I think it's interesting. I don't know if it's going to work. Like, I don't know how you're going to do it. But and and that's when, you know, he was like, let me, you know, he was in between jobs and he said, let me help you. He didn't have any operations experience, but he's as an intellectual property lawyer. He was like, it's just interesting, like what you're doing. And I think it's a lot of fun. And I think for him, too, he wouldn't have said this back then either, but it, he was just really, he, he was a Silicon Valley lawyer, one of the first ones at, at Netscape. And I mean, he was not learning as much as he wanted to learn either. He was involved in lots of business deals and he learned a little bit there, but he felt like, you know, once he saw this world that existed and how everything from how do we get a bigger shelf life, a longer shelf life, how do we get it on the shelf at Whole Foods? Um, he just thought it was interesting. And the other thing that he talks about a lot is that, you know, he had never really worked around somebody who was a brander and a marketer and sort of like a product developer and innovation. And he's married to one, but he had never worked with me. And so he was just like, I just think it's really interesting how you're talking about this, like, and thinking about this. And I think it's really cool. And he, and so that's when, you know, we, we launched, uh, we launched the product actually on the morning of me having a plan C section. And, uh, another story I share in the book that is, um, you know, one where I didn't know whether or not that was going to happen. It wasn't planned. But that day walked into Whole Foods and uh, the gentleman who was uh, the same guy that was that I had been talking to for a few months um, saw how pregnant I was. And the first thing out of his mouth was, uh, you know, are you like, wow, you're super pregnant. Are you having a, are you going to have a baby in the store right now? And I said, gosh, I hope not. Like, you know, and and my husband was just like, did he really just say that? And, you know, he's thinking he's like, he's like, I'll let her handle this. I'm not even going, I'm not even going into this conversation. And then he said, I said, yeah, I'm having a baby at two o'clock this afternoon. Cause, and he said, how do you know you're having a baby at two? And I said, I'm having a planned C-section. And he said, so what's the difference between that and a, an unplanned C-section? And I said, it's called an emergency C-section. And he said, so what's the difference between an emergency C-section and a planned C-section? This guy is stocking the shelves at Whole Foods. And another opportunity to educate. And I said, well, I've, I'm your girl. I've had both an emergency C-section and a planned C-section. So I can share it all with you if you would like. <laughs> and, he's, and he's like, yeah, actually, I would. And so I, next 15 minutes, you know, I shared with him. My husband, meanwhile, like left. He was like, oh my God, like she's having a baby in a couple of hours and she's telling this guy, you know, about the planned succession. And then he can't, comes back and he's, and, you know, didn't know what to expect. And the guy was like, thank you so much for explaining that to me. I've actually, like, I never had any sisters. I've always been curious, like how people know they're having a baby. And I was like, Awesome. Well, can you put my product on the shelf now? And he said, I'll try. I, there's no guarantees. And so at this point, my husband was pulling me out of the store saying, you know, stop selling no more. Like, we'll leave them the cases. If it happens, it happens. And and then we went and delivered my son, Justin. And the next morning they called me in the hospital. The guy did. And he said, the cases are gone. And I said, who took them? Like I still didn't like I, I had only focused on getting it on the shelf. I hadn't focused on actually selling the product, like what would happen then. And uh, and so, you know, that's that was uh, 
that there, there's so many stories in, in there, but I think it's, you know, at that point I thought, oh my gosh, like how exciting somebody actually wants my product and they're buying it and maybe I'm right. And maybe this will be, you know, this giant company, but I hadn't even gotten to the point of thinking like, oh, let's go take on Coke or let's right. go take on these other companies. I was just like excited that I had actually sold a case off the shelf at Whole Foods. That's amazing. And all these stories and more are in the new book, Undaunted. Amazing book. Make sure you buy it. We've got about five minutes left. So there's there's a ton of amazing stories in there. But I want to ask you a couple of sort of mindset questions. Um, you learned a phrase uh, that you repeated, you know, don't be afraid to build the plane while you're flying it. I, I think there's a lot of people here watching your company. Now, if I'm accurate, it's probably bigger, 150 million a year company. It's a very large company, very successful. That really intimidates a lot of people. But I want, what I want people to hear is that you just were curious and trying to, to trying to first help yourself and realize, Oh wait, maybe I can help other people. Like this is where you begin. Uh, talk a little bit about, about not being afraid to take the first step or the next step, because I don't want people to, to see this amazing success and not start something that could be a billion dollar company. But I feel like so many people see success like yours and go, Oh, I, I don't even know where to start. So I won't. Yeah, no, it's totally true. I mean, I think, look, we always, as I share with food and beverage entrepreneurs, like we were always um, very careful with our with our product in, in terms, I mean, obviously people are, we didn't want people to get sick off of our product or, or uh, you know, die or, you know, and, and so we were constantly testing the product to make sure that it was safe. Um, but I believe that what one thing that I learned in the tech industry that I think is is so different than any other industry and certainly different from consumer products, food, you know, in particular, but also banking and so many other industries is like once you like the concept of launching something in tech is you get it out the door because it's pretty good. Like it's 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 good. You think it's good, but there's always 2.0. Like for those right. of you who haven't really thought about it, like that, I'm sure Apple has a phone for that will be coming out in two years from now. That is somebody knows about, yeah. right? Tim Cook knows about it. There's a few engineers that know about it, but it's like there's always a better version. Like they'll they'll bring something to market. They get you excited about it, you know, and then and and then like there'll be an upgrade or another version. So I learned that in the tech industry, just thinking that that's the way the world works. And for me, like when I walked into the the drink space, it was like, I thought about it more like you launch a Coke, right? And then you just like, you don't ever change it as long as it's working, right? You just like let the sales happen. When the sales start to go down, then you're like, okay, well maybe we should reformulate. But at this point, everybody's focusing on the fact that like the sales are going down, it's dying, and now they're trying to reformulate. So in addition to actually trying to change the product in some way, you're, you've also got a PR nightmare, right, that you're trying to deal with too. Instead, the tech industry is brilliant. They just keep launching these new things all along the way. And like, I had no idea that that mindset that I was bringing in to Hint was really, you know, new and different and innovative. And so when we launched Hint, we were like, let's just get it on the shelf because I want to go have a baby, right? Like I, I want to like just see how far it'll go. Um, and that first day that we launched, I mean, we were hearing back from customers that they thought it was great. They were, um, we have an email on our bottle from day one where consumers were like, where have you been? I've been looking for an unsweetened flavored water. Like, you know, it was still new to people, but they were definitely letting us know that it was great. But there were things like the lighting in the store at Whole Foods. Like I never thought about that. I never focused on who we would be sitting next to on the shelf. Like if there was a super colorful bottle, it would totally like you couldn't even see my product. And so that is, you know, what I what I mean by building the plane. You're always going to be better. And I think that I take that into, you know, even like building teams and internally, like I, I'm constantly another thing that I talk about in, in the book, it sort of goes along with, you know, always learning, but it also goes along with, you know, being sort of understanding that you can always be better, right? Like this, this mindset of, of constantly like, you know, 
being better is something that some people really grapple with. Like, especially they think like, oh, I'm a great manager. I'm great. And I, and I always challenge them by saying like, you know, but we could always be better. And and I, it's not that I'm not happy with somebody in existing, but right. Like you could, I mean, I talk about this with podcasting, right? Like I'm like, yeah, it's pretty good. You know, like, but it, there, there's always going to be something better. Like, as I say to my kids, like, there's always going to be some, somebody who's smarter than you right out there and can do better. And instead of, and I think that that is, that that's just this mindset that I, I think a lot of people just need to get their arms around. So that's really what I mean. Ted Leonsis is another, you know, brilliant guy who was at AOL and, um, and was involved in two market as, uh, as the point person investor early on. But he used to say something that I still talk about a lot, which was, you know, we're going to throw a lot of watermelons on the cart and some of the watermelons are going to fall off and that's okay. Because your goal is to like, to, is to like basically keep as many watermelons on as possible. And my husband actually says this to me a lot. He said, in a, and when he tries to describe me to people, he was like, Kira's got so much going on. Like he was like, yeah, she fully expects that a few of them are going to fall off the cart. But she like is constantly like trying to make the, mo the majority of them stay on the cart. And I think like that's like when you think about that, like that is really that's success, right? You don't like sit there and only say, OK, I've got one thing and it's going to sit there because then that's risky, right? Instead, you throw a lot on and you try and do the best you can with as many as you can. I love it. And you improve as you go. There's so many lessons in your book, Undaunted, about mindset. Thank you. I've got a hundred more questions. We'll have to have another conversation soon. Thank you so much for your generosity with your time. Everyone go out, get Hint Water, uh, get Undaunted, and follow Kara. She's got amazing wisdom. All Kara Golden, G-O-L-D-I-N, as you can see on the screen. Or if you just listen to audio, G-O-L-D-I-N, go follow her. She's got lots of wisdom, and she is a supremely nice person, which makes me actually like her more. So thanks so much, Kara, for thank your time. You. Thanks so much, Nick. We'll see you guys next time on Nata Next. Thanks so much. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching.